North America's most influential maritime event, CMA Shipping, returns to Connecticut from March 21st to the 23rd. Rallying around a central theme of collaboration for transition, Maritime's Great and Good will be attending in force to discuss the increasingly important role our industry plays in the decarbonisation of global supply chains. Whether you just need a free expo pass to meet some of the industry's leading suppliers, or you're keen to join in all the conference sessions, networking receptions and Commodore's gala dinner, all the information you need about how to get involved can be found at cmashippingevent.com. Welcome to the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast for our latest episode of Maritime Minutes. You are listening to Marcus Hand, editor of Sea Trade Maritime News, and Gary Howard, Europe editor of Sea Trade Maritime News. Maritime in Minutes is our monthly podcast where we pick out some of the most topical news stories from the world of maritime on Sea Trade Maritime News over the last month, and today we're covering February 2023. February is a short month as always, but that doesn't mean there isn't plenty to talk about. Gary, why don't you kick us off? Yep, plenty to talk about this month, so much so that I've picked a couple of sort of honourable mentions here and there for stories where I just couldn't choose between two in the space for a single week. I started February though with a webinar on nuclear power in shipping. We're talking the new molten salt reactors and the financial impact they will have on the industry. Nuclear reactors are expensive. So expensive that while you could retrofit one onto a ship, the cost of the reactor and the fuel is so high that it doesn't really make any sense when you put that next to the the cost of a new ship. The, The ship itself is actually pretty marginal. What I found interesting about the presentation was the discussion of the lifetime cost of a nuclear ship. Core Power, who hosted the webinar, took the example of a $500 million nuclear ship, where $100 million was the ship itself, $150 million was the reactor, and $250 million was for the nuclear fuel. My understanding is that these reactors are are topped up from time to time, so at the end of the ship's lifetime, it will still have a full fuel inventory, but with the magic of inflation, that fuel will be worth half a billion dollars by the end of the ship's lifetime on its own and will be ready for transferring to the next generation of molten salt reactors in ships or wherever they might be. Of course, that's providing that there are molten salt reactors to put that fuel into in 30 years' time, I suppose. But because of all this, core power envisages a, a future where ship operators lease the reactor and its energy, and bundle that all together with maintenance costs, insurance costs, the cost of decommissioning the reactor at the end of its life. And they also expect that the efficiency of modern shipyards will help contain the sort of cost runaways that are often associated with nuclear projects by using modular construction techniques that shipyards are perfectly used to. There's still a fair way for nuclear to go before it enters shipping mainstream, but it was interesting to hear the sort of full commercial reasoning for nuclear as a fuel. That's it for that one, Marcus. What's your week one pick? The first week of the month, I'm turning my attention to the LNG shipping segment, which it is fair to say has pretty much gone bananas over the last 12 months. As with any sector that is doing extremely well, the new building order is, of course, stacking up rapidly. But it's actually worth noting that even before the current boom, the LNG segment had a large order book, if it wasn't exactly fully confirmed, but that was in the shape of Qatar's intentions to order 100 new buildings, which everybody was sure were going to come to fruition. Now, Sea Trade Maritime News correspondent Paul Bartlett reported on how three LNG carriers were ordered every week last year, bringing the total order book to 323 new buildings, or being rather hefty 49% of the current fleet. The big winners of this on the shipbuilding side have been the Chinese yards, which have seen a quadrupling of their market share in the space of 12 months. China State Shipbuilding Corporation inked orders for 49 large-sized LNG carriers last year. That increased its market share to about 30% from less than 7% in the previous year. But even with this surge in Chinese yard contracts, space remains extremely tight in terms of berths for LNG new builds, and owners are reported to be looking at the delivery slots into 2027 and 2028. The outlook for LNG shipping remains extremely bullish, and underscoring this uh, later in the month, uh, Paul reported 
on a 10 year old LNG carrier from Coolco being sold at close to the price of a new building. So there seems to be more to come from that market. Yeah, it, it also feels like the only reason, hopefully the only reason we're not going to rush into a horrible situation where the market gets tanked is that limitation on the shipyard space. Otherwise, we'll have our usual fool's rush in scenario where uh, we have a nice market and then destroy it with loads of ships. Yeah, the, the, the yard capacity side should help limit things. The one question will be FID on new LNG projects and whether these happen in time as the new buildings come out of the yards, as that's generally been a bit of a problem for that market. Now, Gary, week two, and I believe you have something less positive and rather more gritty news. Yeah, a couple of, well, very important stories I'd like to highlight from week two. First up, 2022 was the worst year for seafarer abandonment, with 103 vessels and 1,682 seafarers affected. That's according to Rightship's seafarer abandonment report. There's been a real ramp up in those numbers over the past five to seven years, with unpaid wages totaling over $40 million since 2016. Rightship says it's doing its part by keeping companies involved in seafarer abandonments flagged up within its own platform and never recommending those companies or their vessels to customers. It's also called on more managers to sign up to its and complete its crew welfare assessment and then for the wider industry to use their ESG standards to pressure those unscrupulous operators out of the industry. And then I also have to mention a story from an interview I had with Mark Nesselhut, who is president and executive director at the Siemens Church Institute over in the US. I interviewed Mark about his participation at CMA Shipping 2023, which is an event in former organizers in the US, and that's coming up in March. Now, Mark is speaking on a ship management roundtable panel, and the conference outline for that mentioned the elephant in the room, and I genuinely didn't know what that was. For Mark, he said the elephant in the room for shipping is sexual assault and sexual harassment in the industry, an issue which is making seafaring hostile to women and, of course, causing a great deal of harm and distress. I confess I also wasn't fully aware of the sort of breadth of the areas that the Siemens Church is involved in. And one area is in sort of seafarer advocation at the national and international regulatory level. The church led a push to promote the issue of shore leave at the IMO, ILO and US Coast Guard in 2014, which I think ended in some success. And Mark hopes that the Siemens Church and its sort of legal prowess can help lead the charge on addressing sexual assault and sexual harassment through regulation. So yeah, worth checking that one out. Marcus, have you got something a bit chirpier for us? Yeah, somewhat, I suppose. Um, It was a company that actually was involved in some of those uh, sexual assault allegations in the US, and that is Maersk. But I'm going to be talking something very different about Maersk. Now, as a company, they're probably the best-known brand in shipping. In fact, arguably the only brand in shipping that people outside of shipping have ever heard of. And it's probably a little surprise that the, uh, you know, given the state how well container shipping did last year, that the Danish company booked a record profit of 30.9 billion for 2022. But its forecast is rather more muted for um, this year. Um, they put an ABIT forecast that varied between 2 billion and 5 billion, the lower end of which would probably actually imply there'd be loss making later in 2023, assuming that the first quarter of this year is not a complete disaster. But what I actually really want to focus on with Maersk is where they go from here as a business. The same week as the results were announced, I attended a briefing by the company's Asia-Pacific management, where they explained how far it can go on with a plan to move from being a container line to an integrator across all modes of container shipments and kind of providing a complete suite of end-to-end logistics. Now, we've seen Maersk heavily investing in logistics over the last couple of years, the likes of LF Logistics, Senator in, in Germany, and a bunch of sort of e-commerce fulfillment companies and tech-related acquisitions. And this is all actually part of a longer journey, which has been on process actually for a number of years now. Ditlev Blitcher, president for Maersk Asia Pacific region, characterized its plans as like it was trying to become a FedEx for container shipping, where a customer books a shipment and simply accepts it's going to turn up at the final destination as planned, when it's supposed to, without knowing the details, of how it will get there and all those things, what ship it's on and so forth. Also, with Maersk's exit from the 2M alliance with MSC, they talked about making its container shipping network more adaptable and flexible because they'll be operating on their own. They managed to make it all sound remarkably straightforward. 
But it's not really convinced it actually is. When we take the example of air express shipments, um, and these move much faster than ships, which is helpful. And it enables them to do some very convoluted routings. Uh, if you don't know what I mean, go and check out the tracking on your next transcontinental package. You'll find they move through all sorts of different hubs, there's all sorts of different processing, and it's a really very complex process. Now, if you applied the same to container shipping, the shipment would basically take months. And similarly, a more flexible network. It sounds great, but ships, again, take time to move. There are factors such as terminal contracts to be considered, and so forth. On top of that, there is the sheer scale of what Maersk is actually trying to do, especially if you start looking at inland logistics in countries like China and Indonesia, which are major manufacturing bases. So there's a heck of a lot of work to be done there. Musk estimates it's around 40% there on its journey. Will and when will it reach its destination? Only time will tell, but it's going to be an interesting story to follow, and one I'm sure we're going to be coming back to. If you're enjoying the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on the app of your choice. For week three, Gary, I believe you have another ongoing story. Yeah, ongoing indeed. The International Chamber of Shipping are at it again, putting forward a fresh proposal to the IMO for a measure to tax emissions and fund technological development in shipping. The last ICS proposal to IMO was knocked back at IMO in 2021. ICS says it's done the donkey work on how the regulation will be put into action, the sort of core of the pricing mechanism, and it's left a bit of room for the IMO member states to sort of set the level of things. But the overall idea is to put a flat levy on ships for their CO2 emissions and for the cash raise to go into an IMO fund. That fund will be used to support developing nations in creating and improving their green fuel infrastructure and uh, production, and of course, supporting technological innovation and decarbonisation within shipping you may well feel a sense of deja vu at this story. That's understandable. I think it's probably worth us having a chat with ICS, the team over there, and discuss the the differences between this proposal and the last one and kind of work out why they think this one might be more successful. And then I've got just a quick mention of a story based on a couple of container industry analyses, which sort of ties into what Marcus was saying about Maersk's upcoming performance and forecasts. The headline kind of covers it. Container price war underway, contract rates plummeting. Now, spot rates, as we know, have been on the the downward trajectory for quite a long time, and now contract rates are are, are starting to catch up. This story includes a little look at why that is, and just how little effort lines appear to be putting into cutting their capacity to support rates. So, another one worth checking out. Over to you, Marcus. Indeed, uh, the container shipping price war does look like it's becoming a very real thing. But I'm going to actually come back to the topic of emissions which you and reductions of emissions, which we were just talking about. Now, unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last few months, well, if you're in shipping anyway, you'll have seen quite a lot of ship owning executives getting rather exercised over the IMO's new carbon intensity regulation, CII. Sea Trade Maritime News Greek correspondent David Glass reported on the Union of Greek Ship Owners President Melina Travlos as saying CII was unfair to all ships. I suppose that's a level playing field, if nothing else. Now, certainly no one is trying to say that CII is perfect, but it's not like the regulation was stealthily snuck up on the industry. Yet, if I think back a year, I don't remember much in the way of complaining about it. In fact, most seem to be quite unworried about compliance. One of the main complaints, indeed, about CII and EEXI at the time seemed to be that they didn't go far enough. It was only in the second half of last year when we started hearing loud objections being made by ship owners as they delved into the details of compliance, which did seem a tad late, really. There was a comment made on my LinkedIn post on that story on the Union of Creek Ship Owners, and the comment was basically that, you know, this was simply a delaying tactic by the industry. Now, that's a bit cynical, perhaps, but talking to a large operator of vessels in Singapore last week, they seemed also pretty unimpressed by the negative reaction and likened it somewhat to the alarm that was generated in the run-up to the IMO 2020 sulfur curve, the implementation of which was actually quite smooth. And he said, you know, while saying CII was not perfect, the senior executive said it was a step in the right direction. 
and noted you know, that their own fleet was in compliance. This sort of story is obviously set to run for a while, but I think it also highlights that whatever environmental regulations there are going to be for shipping, they are likely to prove controversial in one way or another. And Gary, back to you for week four and something else in the industry that people don't think works very well. Yeah, and with good reason, actually. I had a chat with Christian Rolos, who's co-founder and CEO at Container Exchange. Uh, that's a container logistics platform. Christian took me through the sort of back-end processes that enable a container to be found, secured, moved across the world and left where it's supposed to be so someone can find it again. You may look at world trade and think that containers are pretty efficient, but the whole show is built on a series of faxes, WhatsApp messages, emails, and texts. Christian told me that the sort of manual and time-intensive nature of these communications means that when anything goes wrong in one of the 200 or 250 steps in the container operations process, fixing that issue takes a great deal of time and effort. Container Exchange's own research shows that NVOCCs and freight forwarders spend something like 80% of their time manually dealing with these manual problems, which just sounds awful to me. Getting those various platforms and systems talking to one another could make for some serious efficiency gains and allow those NVOCCs and freight forwarders to sleep at night and take holidays. Check out the story on Sea Trade Maritime News, and then my full conversation with Christian is also on the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, so more detail there. Marcus, the uh, the last story or stories are on you. Yes, thank you, Gary. Just to say, that podcast is absolutely fantastic. It's really, really interesting. And yeah, can you believe that people are still using faxes? I can't remember the last time I actually saw a fax machine. Anyway, coming to the my pick for week four, and it's another story by Sea Trade Maritime News correspondent Paul Bartler, who's been a busy man in February. The date of 20th February is a very important one in the world of P&I, as all contracts and renewals for mutual insurance need to be in place by noon UK time on that date, or else basically you risk not being able to trade. Going back a few years, it was a date that largely sort of passed off without you know, major incident, albeit the run-up was an extremely busy time if you were a P&I executive. But this year has proved somewhat more fraught, as the 13 P&I club members of the international group have sought a fourth year of significant increases of around 10%. Paul noted that the increases resulted from three years of successive high pool claims, those of more than $10 million, and higher reinsurance rates, which were just two of the factors which P&I club managers have been contending with of late. This backdrop saw negotiations for some deals going down to the wire, with agreements apparently signed just hours before the deadline. It's a like, story that we'll be likely returning to on Sea Trade Maritime News in the coming weeks, so look out for that for more details. And just before we close off February, I'd like to flag up a story that appeared right towards the end of the month, on February 27th. For those interested in the world of ship management, I had an interview with Wallum CEO John Carey Una, which focused on the importance of crewing for the continued growth of the sector. So if you're interested in that one, check it out on CJ Maritime News, and the link to that story will be in the show notes. And that brings us to the end of this month's Maritime in Minutes. If you want to know more about all of the stories mentioned in this podcast, the links are in the show notes. Or just head over to ctrade-maritime.com to read all of these and all the latest Maritime news. And that's all we have time for in this latest episode of Maritime in Minutes. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe on the app of your choice to never miss an episode. Until the next episode of the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, stay safe.